All right, we are in the book of Genesis. Uh, we ended up Genesis chapter 4, but our subject is not Genesis. Our subject is the flood. But we have been discussing the earth prior to the flood, just beginning in that, reading the text uh, in Genesis chapter 4 and uh, describing what uh, was going on concerning that. Well, you had uh, Adam and Eve, and then you have... Uh, we only know two of Adam and Eve's children. They had untold number of children. We don't know, but we know Cain. I'm sorry, we know three. Cain, Abel, and Abel was murdered by Cain, and then Seth. And uh, the Abel had no children. Uh, but uh, we, have, we have Cain and Seth that continue on. Uh, and... Um, they are, uh, they are only two of the many children that Adam and Eve must have had. And we discussed that. Uh, one is that we know that Adam had sons and daughters. That's in uh, Genesis chapter 5. We see that. And we have no, we know three of the sons, and that's it. We don't know any of the others, and we don't know any of the daughters' names. But uh, we want to make note, just for the sake of it, because we need to do it, that in Genesis chapter 3, verse 20, and Adam called his wife's name Eve because she was the mother of all living. So the question is, where did Cain get his wife? Or where did Seth get his wife? Well, it would have to be a close relative. With Cain, it would probably have to be a sister. With uh, Seth, probably a sister, but could very well have been a niece. Uh, Seth, we know, is coming well down the line as far as years are concerned, 130, I do believe. Thereabouts after creation. Uh, because, let me, let me check over here, it's an easy check. Uh, yeah, 130 years. Uh, that's how old Adam is when he has Seth, when Seth is born. Adam is 130 years, which means Eve is 130 years. They have a very, very, uh, uh, quite an extensive childbearing years uh, with us. It's considerably shorter. In those days, it was considerably longer, just like their lifespans were much longer, about 10 times longer than our own. And we also see of where Cain, in talking to, to God, in uh, chapter 4, verse 13, he says, My punishment is greater than I can bear. Surely you have driven me this day from the face of the ground. I shall be hidden from your face. I shall be a fugitive and a vagabond on the earth. And it will happen that anyone who finds me will kill me. All right. Well, him saying, in anyone who finds me will kill me, he's not talking about just his mom and dad are the only ones around. Uh, there are others around, and it may be brothers. It could also be nephews. Uh, there are others that are around in, when he says this. So he is very much afraid that uh, there would be vengeance done on him. Uh, and it, like I said, it, it wasn't just uh, Cain and then Adam and Eve. There had to have been others uh, who, were, who lived during that day. Now, there's something we also want to make mention that I didn't mention. And uh, let's, let's go right here. It's actually in uh, chapter 2, verse 22. And uh, while I read it, uh, I didn't go into specific, a, a specific subject that, that we probably need to. So we're in Genesis 4, 22. And as for Zillah, she also bore Tubal-Cain, an instructor of every craftsman in bronze and iron, and the sister of Tubal-Cain was Naamah. All right, so we're, we're only, uh, let's see, I think we're uh, in the, uh, oh, I'm in the wrong place. Am I in the wrong place? No, we're in the eighth generation of, uh, from, uh, from Adam. This is the line of Cain. So we're in the eighth generation here. And uh, in this eighth generation, if I have this right, uh, we, we have 
uh, already a man, Tubal Cain, who, and this is pre-flood now, he is a craftsman in bronze and iron. Now we've talked about this briefly, that it requires discovery and skill and uh, just uh, learning how to do things to be able to extract ore. Iron is an element, but iron doesn't hang around in iron ingots. You've got to find the iron. You have to mine it. Then you have to extract it. Then you have to purify it and make it to, in, into a form that you can use. That's what Tubalcane begins. Now, uh, bronze, however, is not an, an element. It's an alloy. It's a mix. So you've got to mine copper and you've got to mine tin and then you've got to mix them to see what you get and what the value is. Now, what I want to bring out today that I didn't bring out last week is that uh, the way the world has done things, the popular way uh, the world has done things in talking about historical time periods, it will talk about the Stone Age. As though all men knew how to do was to chip away at stone, that all, uh, all uh, tools were stone tools, uh, like um, the Flintstones. Okay, all, all tools were just basically a stick wrapped around a stone, and there you have a stone tool. Then they also talk about the Iron Age and the Bronze Age, and as though during those periods of time, it was just knowing iron. That's iron was the best they could do. And then come the Bronze Age. Uh, they now have gone beyond that to be able to, to make uh, these alloys of bronze, bronze having a different quality than iron does. Uh, and uh, iron, iron will rust on you. Iron's a pretty strong element, but it'll rust. Bronze won't do that. And uh, uh, you have uh, uh, here, prior to the flood, prior to the flood, the very first one who's dealing th with this, he's, he's dealing in iron. He works in iron. And he also works in bronze. And we can get caught up into, into thinking that somehow men were not very bright in the past that and of course from an evolutionary standpoint evolutionary standpoint uh, thinking of things uh, in a in a as darwin would have us to think or as atheists would have us to think that the people of the past were not bright at all but the fact of the matter is they were extremely intelligent they were working with just on the ground level, whereas we're, we're born into a time when so many things have already been developed. But they were not. They were not living in such a time. If it was going to be developed, they're going to develop it. They've got to break the ground to do this. And uh, this whole idea of Stone Age, and it, well, if this wasn't the Stone Age, there was no Stone Age. All right. If this wasn't the Stone Age, because he's dealing already in iron and bronze, already. So the people back then, they were brilliant. Now, here comes the question. All right, if they dealt in such things, why is there no archeological evidence for such? Good question. What if there was what would, what would it mean? All right, now I'm just going to ask this hypothetically. Hypothetically, if there is evidence of ancient men using metal, ancient men using metal tools, just think of this hypothetically, what would the conclusion be? What would it be? All right, and don't play the game of, I'm not going to deal with the hypothetical. All right, you, that's just cowarding away. That's all that is. That's just, just being a coward, and you don't want to, to face uh, what the fact, just toy around with that, that idea. Don't want to toy around with it at all. But think about it. If the ancients were working in iron, and they were working in bronze, as Genesis 4 says was the beginnings of it, 
what does it mean? It means that people in the past weren't uh, exactly uh, dummies. They knew what they were doing. All right. And uh, I had it here just a second ago. And uh, I just, there's an illustration that they've made in this book. And yeah, we're, we're uh, kind of using this book uh, for, which is uh, flooded. It's Apologetics Press. It's by Jeff Miller. Uh, but if you will, you can, you can see it uh, in the back room. There's a poster, and you can also see it, I do believe, on the timeline where uh, they have an illustration. It's just, an, just a, uh, uh, an illustration of Noah. And Noah is carrying a hammer. And you would look at the hammer and you'd say, hmm, that's, yeah, that's a unique design. That is very unusual. But the illustrator who did that designed it off of this. That is an ancient hammer embedded in rock. That's precisely what that is. That is an iron hammer, wooden handle. It was discovered deep in the earth. All right. This cannot be explained except that some human, very ancient human, made this. All right, this wasn't done by accident. This isn't just a, uh, some kind of of uh, uh, like atheists always do that you know given in time given in time surely something looking like a hammer would develop all right no this is don't be don't be ignorant don't fool yourself this is a hammer well all right what else you got well there's also this this was found in coal this is an ancient bell it's brass bronze all right well, we know that there was, already, there was a worker in bronze. So if you have one person working in bronze and discovers it, what does that mean? He's the only one that knows how to do that? No, he's going to teach his kids. And, he's, and his kids are going to teach their kids. And it's, it's, uh, it's going to spread. And other people are going to be able to do it. And they will begin to do things like this. Why not? It wouldn't be just tools. It would be things such as this, whatever that bell was used for. All right. Once again, found embedded in coal. Let me just tell you this. If something is found embedded in coal, it's extremely ancient. To where your modern day atheists will not want to address it. They will not want to even think about it. That it should, if under atheism, if something shouldn't exist, they will ignore it. And they don't want anyone knowing about it. But this is a very, very ancient artifact. Now, being that this thing has wings, and I know you can't really see its face, it isn't uh, the, the best as far as sculpting is concerned. I mean, okay, so you're going to be an art critic on this. It's not the best as far as that's concerned, but one may think that this is, uh, has some kind of supernatural, obviously, supernatural or, or mythical or some element about it. There's something about it that uh, it's not a, a, a natural animal or just a person on this. This is something with wings that's on it. And what does it represent? I don't know. But there are other things on this earth that only places such as Apologetics Press and Answers in Genesis and um, uh, Creation Research Institute and others, they're the only ones that will publicize, the, publicize these things. Nobody else wants to publicize them. Nobody. Such as... Uh, with uh, the Kumwat, uh, the uh, temple in uh, uh, Cambodia, I think it is. Uh, it's a massive, massive temple there, and it is covered 
with depictions. It's covered, it's just carved all over. And one of the depictions, and we'll, we'll get to that later, not today. One of the depictions there, aside from things such as uh, a, a, a monkey or a snake, uh, an elephant, you know, these things that one would expect to find in that part of the world is also a dinosaur, clearly a dinosaur that is there. And we've not mentioned dinosaurs, but yes, these people that we're discussing today, that would have been a common element in their world, dinosaurs. And dinosaurs would not have uh, lived prior to humans. Dinosaurs, if only by a few hours, or maybe not even a few hours. Uh, their dinosaurs, those on land, not those in the sea, but those on land, uh, would have uh, been uh, created on the sixth day, the same day that man was created. And man and dinosaurs lived at the same time. Uh, they lived at the same time for a long time. And uh, today is not about dinosaurs, but we will get to that because we do need to get to that. Uh, and uh, don't think that the Bible doesn't mention dinosaurs. Now, it doesn't mention it by that name because that's a modern name. That came about in the uh, 19th century, and it's an English word at that. There was no Hebrew word for dinosaur, but there was a Hebrew word for behemoth and leviathan, which, of course, we see those one place in uh, the book of Job. And what is being described there, it's not a squirrel, even though the, the Bible doesn't mention squirrels. <laughs> uh, uh, it does mention dinosaurs. It mentions these creatures that are monstrous. Uh, one is, uh, a behemoth is huge, and Leviathan, while not as big, was a vicious sort of thing in the sea, and you wouldn't want to meet it. Uh, now, let's continue on. We go to Genesis chapter 5. And what we're going to do today is read the genealogy because we need to. And then we're going to work out the math because we need to do that. Why? One is there, this is showing us the genealogy that goes from Adam to Abraham. And it's going to make its way. Now, it's not going to do that all in chapter 5. It's going to continue after the flood with Shem, Ham, and Japheth, specifically uh, Noah to Shem and then working on to, uh, uh, to Abram or Abraham. And uh, in chapter 5, there is a system, a pattern that it is doing so that we can know the timeline. We can know the years from creation to the flood. And we can know the years from creation all the way to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. We can know how many years it was because we have this kind of information given to us. And that's why that timeline in the hallway can do such a thing. It can show you how many years it was from uh, creation all the way to the birth, birth of Isaac. If you know uh, how long it was uh, getting up to, to Abram and how old Abram or Abraham was when he had Isaac, then you can, you can know. You can know uh, all this. Now, some, especially out in the world, but there are some in the church, and I've met them, that they do not believe this timeline is an accurate timeline. But we go by the principle, let God be true and every man a liar. And also understand that this is precisely what Genesis chapter 5 was meant to be. It was meant to list by name the generations going from, in, in chapter 5, going to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Uh, Adam all the way to Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And that... Um, 
with this, with the pattern that is there of the numbers, we can put the numbers down and we can see what year the flood occurred. Now, if there are gaps, then there are, there's a serious problem. If there are gaps, because Genesis chapter 5 does, works out perfectly. Works out perfectly from father to son, then from son to grandson, grandson to great-grandson, and then on down. There is no skipping. There's, there is, is nothing that says, and somewhere along the line, this person was born and they had this son. It doesn't, it doesn't say that. Now, let's, let's read this. And I realize that this isn't exactly the most interesting, genealogies aren't exactly the most interesting things to read. But they're there for a reason. They're not there for entertainment. They are there putting forth evidence and proof and showing this is the age of the earth. This is the age. If you have a problem with that, you have a problem with Genesis. If you have a problem with Genesis, you have the problem with the entire Bible and with God. He is the one who has inspired this through Moses to write this. And there's no way Moses could have known this on his own. There's no way. But let's look. So Genesis chapter 5, verse 1. This is the book of the genealogy of Adam. In the day that God created man, he made him in the likeness of God. He created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. This is what mankind is about. This creates mankind, male, female. You cannot have one without the other. You cannot have one without the other. Now, I'm going to make, go back to the question of where did Cain get his wife or where did Seth get his wife. Well, it would have to be a close relative, either a sister uh, for Cain and granted, I don't know how old Adam was when he had Cain. I have no idea because it doesn't say. It doesn't say how old he was. And we'll also make mention this week that Cain is not mentioned in the text because he was the firstborn. He's mentioned in the text because he was a murderer, the first one. Uh, at least there's, there's no other evidence of anybody who predates Cain as being a murderer except Satan, murderer from the beginning. And uh, uh, we, can, we can discuss that at, at a later, well, we have discussed that. But where did they get their wives? It had to be a sister or with Seth, it could also have been a niece. All right, the skeptics will say, well, that doesn't work. Marrying your sister will only bring about uh, genetic defects in their children. Well, today it will. But I would remind those who are of the atheistic bent, that evolution has the same situation. It has the precise situation of where, but it's, it's more difficult, <laughs> considerably more difficult. You had to have two humans born at the same time, that one is male and one is female, from non-humans. Okay, you got to. You got to have uh, either a non-human becomes human in their lifetime, however that's done, or a non-human uh, gives birth to a human. Well, that non-human would have to give birth to uh, the counterpart in human uh, to where you have male and female. Well, who, do they, uh, who are they going to marry? Well, they're going to marry the other human, obviously. They've got to. And from that their children would have to marry each other. Uh, otherwise, you're going to go back to a non-human form is what you're going to do. And you're, you've got uh, a, uh, or <laughs> uh, uh, if, you, if you go by the whole thing of, of in the ancient days, and we'll talk about that in a second, in the ancient days that there was a stronger genetic code than today, stronger. And the atheists also have to say 
Yes, there was. Uh, and they do, actually. They do say there, there had to have been a stronger genetic code in the past. There had to be. Now, Adam and Eve would have in them every feature, genetically, every feature that would be in humanity. In them, they would have every feature. And uh, from them would be all of us. And as we go through time, that genetic code gets a little thinner and a little thinner and a little thinner and a little bit more spread out to where uh, eventually in time, uh, it is extremely unwise to marry someone who's a close relative. And matter of fact, under the law of Moses, it's going to be outlawed. But uh, atheists and evolutionists have the same situation. So don't feel all smug or anything like that, that somehow uh, atheism has uh, a better situation, a more viable situation, and, and a more provable situation. It does not. It shares the same kind of, of uh, problem that would be found among the human population if the human population were created by God. Well, they were created by God. And they were created, we were created, to begin with, with extremely strong, extremely strong genetic code. And through time, as we've spread out, which we have, through time, it's gotten weaker and weaker and weaker. Now, Genesis chapter 5, and we will just look at verse 2 again. And he created them male and female and blessed them and called them mankind in the day they were created. So, chapter 5 is continuing on with that affirmation that they were created. They were created, both male and female, on the same day. Verse 3, And Adam lived 130 years and begot a son in his own likeness after his image and named him Seth. Now we already found that out in chapter 4, that that, uh, that occurred, that Seth was born, but we don't know how old Adam was in chapter 4 when this happened. Chapter 5, it's telling us when it happened how old Seth was. And, Se I'm, I'm sorry, how old Adam was when Seth was born. And Seth was born 130 years after creation. 130 years. So, significant time has passed. And Seth is born. After he begot Seth, the days of Adam were 800 years. And he had sons and daughters. He had sons and daughters. That means Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. And we don't know the daughters' names. We know three of the sons' names. How many sons and daughters did they have? Well, I can tell you this, that if they can have children at 130 years, they can have a lot of kids. They can have kids that are grandparents while, and even great-grandparents while Adam and Eve continue to have children. Now, we see where Adam and, the, and all the days of Adam lived, all the days that Adam lived were 930 years and he died. So he lives to 930 years on this earth. So at 930, after creation, Adam dies. Seth lived 105 years and begot Enosh. After he begot Enosh, Seth lived 807 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Seth were 912 years, and he died. Enosh lived 90 years and begot Kynan. Uh, after he begot Kynan, Enosh lived 815 years and had sons and daughters. All the days of Enosh were 905 years, and he died. Kynan lived 70 years and begot Mah Mah Mahalalel. And this is now uh, fifth generation. After he begot Mahalalel, Canaan lived 840 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Cain, uh, Canaan were 910 years and he died. Mahalalel lived 65 years and begot Jared. After he begot Jared, Mahalalel lived 830 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Mahalalel were 800 years, I'm sorry, 895 years 
years and he died. Jared lived 162 years and begot Enosh, or Enoch. After he begot Enoch, Jared lived 800 years and had sons and daughters. Notice, notice all of these had sons and daughters, but they're only telling us the name of one son. Why? Because this is the line leading to Noah. And from Noah, of course, Shem, Ham, and Japheth, but from Shem going to Abraham. So all the days of Jared were 962 years, and he died. Enoch lived 65 years and begot Methuselah. After he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God 300 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Enoch were 365 years, and Enoch walked with God, and he was not for God took him. So he does not have a natural death. He is taken by God. And Enoch, we know, was, he walked with God. We get this from chapter 5. But we also know that from Jude, the book of Jude, that Enoch, in fact, was a prophet. And he prophesied concerning the day of judgment. All the way back then. He's not talking about the flood. He's talking about the day of judgment. Now, this is pre-flood days, and God is very interested in righteousness. He's very interested in it. And how do you have people obey you if there is no tooth or no teeth in the law? How, do you have, how will they obey you if there's no teeth in the law? And if you don't like that idea... Well, what do you think your local laws are all about? There, are, there is punishment, at least there's supposed to be punishment, in the local laws that we have of uh, town, county, state, federal. Those are all laws that we are to keep, and yet there is punishment in that. Now, Enoch speaks of... Uh, the, the day of judgment. Now verse 22, after he begot Methuselah, Enoch walked with God, yeah, we, we read with this, 300 years and had sons and daughters. So he has, he has sons and daughters. All the days of Enoch were 365 years and Enoch walked with God and he was not for God took him. Methuselah lived 187 years and begot Lamech. After he begot Lamech, Methuselah lived 782 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of, of Methuselah were 969 years, and he died. Methuselah is the oldest one recorded in the Bible, but that doesn't mean he's the oldest one who's ever lived. He's not mentioned here because he's the oldest. He's mentioned here because he's in the line heading to Abraham, and he just happens to be the oldest among them. There's going to be someone who lives longer than anybody else, and Methuselah is it. In this. Now, Lamech lived 182 years and had a son, and he called his name Noah, saying, This one will comfort us concerning our work and the toil of our hands because of the ground which the Lord has cursed. Now, we found that out going back to Genesis chapter 3. All right, that is uh, the, the ground is cursed there, and that uh, uh, now. Going to chapter 30, after he begot Noah, Lamech lived 595 years and had sons and daughters. So all the days of Lamech were 777 years and he died. And Noah was 500 years old and Noah begot Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Now, if a man could be 500 years old and still have children, that is a long time that you can have children. That is a long time. And concerning all of these, he is the one that has the, the ones mentioned in the genealogy here, the latest, 500 years old. Now, we can know that the, the flood takes place when Noah is 600 years old because it tells us. 
in chapter 7, verse 11, in the 600th year of Noah's life, in the second month, in the 17th day of the month, on that day all the fountains of the great deep were broken up and the windows of heaven were opened. And that is fascinating that it tells us the exact day it happened. Not just the year. It tells us the month, the day, and the year that it happened. And that's specific. That is specific in, in all of that. Now, we can know some things. We can know how many years it was from creation to the flood. And we're going to do it, we're going to do it very, very simply because it's just a matter of addition. That's all it is. It's nothing greater than that. And uh, very simple to do. Okay, so we have Adam living 130 years, and he has Seth. So from Adam to Seth is 130 years. Adam lives 930 years total. Okay, so really all we have to do is have the, these first numbers of father to son when the son was born, and when that son, how old that son happened to be before he had a son, well, then we can work this out pretty easily. So here we have it, and if you can see the numbers I have up here, I have a 1 over Adam, a 2 over Seth, 3 Enish, 4 Canaan, or Kainan, uh, 5 Mahalalel, 6 Jared, 7 Enoch. That's because these are the, the number of generations. Enoch happens to be in the seventh generation from Adam. Okay, so Adam to Seth is 130 years. Seth to Enish, 105 years. Enish to Kainan, 90 years. Kainan to Mahalalel, 70 years. Mahalalel to Jared, 65 years. Jared to Enish, or Enoch rather, 162 years. Enoch to Methuselah, 65 years. Methuselah to Lamech, 187 years. Lamech to Noah is 182 years. And Noah for Shem, Ham, and Japheth is 500 years. Now, notice that Noah is the only one, else except for uh, Adam, Noah is the only one that it shows more than one son by name. And there's a reason for that. Now the genealogy heading toward uh, Abraham can only come through one of these, and it's Shem. Ham and Japheth are mentioning this because they too are going to be in the ark. Noah and his wife, his sons and their wives, they will be in the ark. Therefore, Ham and Japheth are mentioned here because they're going to be in the ark. Not that they're part of the genealogy heading to, to Abraham, because they can't be. Uh, now, we go from this point, and we've already made mention that Genesis 7, 11, uh, makes mention that Noah is 600 years uh, years old when the flood comes. So here are our numbers. And all we have to do is add these numbers together. C the creation, creation week happens on year one. You can't have a year zero, by the way. Uh, when he says, let there be light, that we could call that day one of year one. All right? And so from creation to the flood, we have these numbers, and all we have to do is put these numbers together, and we come to 1,656 years from creation to the flood. That's how long the, that pre-Diluvian or antediluvian world lasted, 1,656 years. And in that time, they could have children at 500 years old. They could still have children at 500 years old. And they were living into their 900s. And the, the youngest one in all this is, is Enosh. He didn't live that long on the earth because he's taken by God. He is, he is this prophet that is, is taken by him. And as we made mention last week, if you can live 900 years, that means your span of a career would be centuries, not decades, and you'd be pretty good at whatever you were doing. You'd be pretty good. Now, today, someone can, who's young 
can begin an apprenticeship or begin to learn of something. And through decades, they can begin to per perfect whatever it is that they do, whatever it is. Doctor will get better. Uh, a, a plumber will get better. Someone who uh, builds things will get better at building things. That's what, that's what happens. You get an increase in skill. Well, we do that in a matter of decades. What if you had centuries to do that? And what if you had genuine uh, geniuses, we could call them that, who could live that long, uh, such as uh, that of Tubal Cain with uh, bronze and iron, or with Jubal, who is harp and flute, who's a musician and a maker of instruments, would not their craft increase year by year, decade by decade, century? by century, and it would. Of course it would. One of the great things about the apologetic trust stuff is they make Noah look like someone who could build an ark. <laughs> yeah. He's not a 500-week-old man yeah. like some of us think. Right, right. Okay, uh, for the sake of the microphone, uh, Apologetics Press does uh, illustrate Noah in a, uh, a rather muscular form. And that let's not think of a 500-year-old man in the ancient world. Now, 500-year-old man today is a man that's been in the tomb for a while. Okay, you've got bones is what you've got today. But in those days, because the earth was so different, a 500-year-old man, he's middle-aged, and he uh, is going to be really uh, extraordinary at whatever he does because he's had 500 years to perfect something. Now, uh, Noah, w did Noah build anything prior to the flood? I don't know. Now he's going to have help. He's going to help, have help eventually with his sons. He's going to ha obviously have help with God. God's going to tell him how it's to be made. That's going to be in, in uh, once we get into to chapter 6, that's going to be there. But uh, to think of a, uh, our envisioning of a 500-year-old man is kind of an impossibility, but our, you know, in just envisioning someone who's 100 years old, you couldn't expect them to build an ark. But in those days, yes, you could. And, of course, God's not going to ask Noah to do something he couldn't do. He's going to ask Noah to do something he can do, and he accomplishes this. And so... Uh, here we have these 1,656 years uh, in this pre-Diluvian world that would have been extraordinary. And as we showed at the beginning of this, matter of fact, I'm going to show it again, that uh, at the beginning of this, you have, here is an iron tool. It's embedded in rock and was discovered deep underground. They, the atheists don't want to discuss this except to try to make it into a fraud. Okay, but my question is, what if it's not a fraud? What then? What if it's not, what if it can be proven that this is not a fraud? This is a very, very ancient iron tool, and it's a hammer, and it's a big one. All right, well, it's, it's, meant to do, it's meant to do some heavy-duty work, obviously. Otherwise, uh, what's the point of, of uh, making it in iron? But there's also this. This is uh, brass or bronze, and it is an ancient bell. And it was discovered embedded in coal deep underground. And the only way it can be embedded in coal deep underground is that this thing was ancient and this thing got caught up and all the other stuff that's going to be buried in the flood. This is a pre-Diluvian artifact. We don't have a lot of them, but this, matter of fact, well, we could have more than we realize. Uh, and let's just, let's just speak for a moment. What if there were cities, and I don't mean Atlantis, what if there were cities that truly are now underwater. What if? What if that were a hypothetical? 
And what if it were in fact true? There are ancient cities underwater. And it is a known fact. Matter of fact, you can go visit one right now if you had the equipment to do it. It's not terribly deep, but it's off the, uh, I think it's the, the west coast of India, it, complete with streets and buildings and all kinds of things that are there. What if there were such things as that? What if? What if you have massive graveyards where animals, including dinosaurs, but where animals were buried alive simultaneously, and we know they were buried alive together because their bodies are intertwined. All right, what if you have that? What does that mean? Something very powerful buried them. They could not have died one by one and just curled up next to the one that died before it. And then they somehow, bit by bit, they're, they're covered over in, in sediment. No, it all happened at the same time. Now, we will continue next week. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate you being with us.